In December 1988, a few days before Christmas, a passenger airliner with 259 people on board was bombed over Scotland on a transatlantic flight between London and New York in what was one of the largest pre-9-11 terrorist attacks, in which history would refer to it as the Lockerbie bombing. This video will attempt to document a chronological order of events which led up to the event on December 21st, 1988. The incident plane belonging to Pan American World Airways was a Boeing 747-100, the first iteration of the iconic 747. In fact, registered as November 739 Papa Alpha, this was one of the first 747s off the production line. Pan American commissioned Boeing to produce this airplane for these transatlantic crossings, which were becoming more popular, and also to replace the 707s. Even by 1988, the 747-100 was an aging airplane. Boeing had already released two upgrades to the original 747, and they were even about to launch their brand new 400 model, which is still widely used to this day. To begin discussing Flight 103, we must start with the Cold War. For most of the latter half of the 20th century, Europe was split between East and West, supposedly between Western capitalist Europe and communist or Soviet-controlled Eastern Europe. President Vaclav Havel of the former communist state of Czechoslovakia disclosed in 1990 that during the communist regime, a substantial amount of the plastic explosive Semtex was sold through Omnipol, a Czech-based company specializing in military equipment, directly to the government of Libya sometime in the 1980s. Semtex being the same plastic explosive that was used in the downing of Flight 103. 16 days before the flight, on December 5th, 1988, a telephone call comes through to the US Embassy in Helsinki, Finland, by a man who was described with having an Arabic accent. He told the embassy that a Pan Am flight was to be blown up in the next two weeks and that the plane would be leaving from Frankfurt, Germany. As a result, the FAA issued a security bulletin, which was sent out to all American air carriers, including Pan Am. A few days later, on the island nation of Malta, a shopkeeper, Tony Gauci, who owns the Mary's House clothes shop in Sliema, Malta, gets a customer through his door. The gentleman enters the store, picking out random items of clothing with seemingly no pattern. Gauchi's eyewitness described the man as an Arabic-looking man with a Libyan accent. This witness from Gauchi helped convict Abdel Basset Ali Mohamed Al-Magrahi as the only person responsible for the downing of Flight 103. The clothes bought from the store included everything from men's jackets to baby's clothes, as well as other items such as an umbrella. This store was tracked down by investigators by examining fragments of clothing from the wreckage of the Pan Am plane. Fragments of clothing that appeared to investigators to have been very close to the initial bomb explosion, within centimeters. Attached to some of these garments was the label, Made in Malta. From this, investigators tracked down Gauchi's store, where he gave the invaluable eyewitness account. Gauchi also recalled that the same man who bought the clothes also bought an umbrella. Investigators, using a similar umbrella that was in Gauchi's store, were able to compare that with the fragments which were close to the explosion and found a match. The man that entered the Mary House shop that day is believed to be the Lockerbie Bomber, however we will return to this at the end of the video. Alongside clothing that was found to be amongst the wreckage that was very close to the bomb, fragments of an electronics device, including part of a printed circuit board, began to show signs of also being very close to an explosion. After examination, these fragments appeared to be part of a particular type of Toshiba radio. Around two months before the bombing of Flight 103, Police in West Germany confiscated an improvised explosive device contained within a Toshiba radio. As it turns out, there was no connection. However, the similarity between the two events was enough for the investigation to contact Toshiba for help with the investigation. It was determined that the fragments showed distinctive signs of being very close to an explosion, and that this was the radio that concealed the bomb. Toshiba also confirmed that the bomb was concealed inside a model RT-SF-16 Toshiba radio and cassette player. As it turns out, Toshiba branded this radio coincidentally as a bomb beat radio. Contained within the radio was a significant amount of the Semtex plastic explosive that was supplied to the Libyan government from Czechoslovakia. The explosive was wired to a detonator which was then directly connected to the timer. We must now discuss the different types of timers used by terrorists to bomb passenger planes. The first type would be a timer that is also connected to a barometer. This is also known as a barometric timer. This timer measures changes in not altitude as is commonly thought, but rather air pressure. 
The significant changes in air pressure needed to trigger the bomb guarantees to a bomber that the plane would be in the air at the time of explosion. However, this timer was not connected to the bomb on board Flight 103. The bomb in question is a simple bomb connected to a chronometer. This bomb was set to go off at a specific time rather than once a specific unit of air pressure measurement was reached. By the time the bomb detonates, the plane was expected to be over the Atlantic Ocean. The timer in question is thought to be an MST-13 timer, manufactured by the Swiss firm Mebo Telecommunications. Mebo had supposedly supplied 20 of these timers to Libya, and around 10 months before the bombing, with help from the FBI, a Libyan intelligence officer was arrested in Senegal at Dakar airport for allegedly carrying an MST-13 timer along with 9 pounds of Semtex and TNT. Remnants of this timer were also found in the Scottish countryside after police officers, investigators and volunteers searched the countryside inch by inch and stumbling upon various pieces of another printed circuit board. Photographs were taken and they were compared against the FBI's database looking for the correct timer. Now that we have discussed the timer, we should move on to what concealed the entire bomb, that being the radio, the explosives, timer, detonator and the clothes bought from the Mary's House shop in Malta, the suitcase. The bomber used a hard brown Samsonite suitcase to carry the bomb. The Toshiba radio with all the bomb components inside was placed in the center of the suitcase with the timer already active. The clothes were then fitted around the radio and the wall of the Samsonite case. A mock-up of the bomb was constructed by police in Scotland with help from Toshiba, Samsonite and Mebo. And now that the bomb is constructed, we'll now move on to the day of the actual bombing. On December 21st, 1988, the bomber, in connection to the Libyan government, carries the bomb onto a plane heading to Malta. The bag is then transferred onto another flight from Malta to Frankfurt, supposedly on board an Air Malta flight. However, Air Malta denies this and says that it can account for all luggage and passengers on its flight between Malta and Frankfurt that day, Abdel Basset Al Magrahi not being one of them. Once in Frankfurt, the case is then checked onto flight 103A, a Pan Am feeder flight to London Heathrow on board a 727. Passengers and luggage will then change onto the Boeing 747 involved in the bombing, where it will then carry on to the United States. Remember, during all of this, the timer inside the bomb is already ticking away. In London, the cargo and passengers switched to the larger plane. Passengers from Frankfurt could book the flight to New York as one booking, but the plane switch was still necessary. This was common back in the 1980s and prior to utilize multiple aircraft like this. It was done in order to fill the seats on the 747 by having planes full of passengers from multiple flights congregate together and fly to New York all in one plane. In London's Heathrow Airport, the bomb is then transferred onto Pan Am Flight 103 on the 747 in baggage container AVE4041, around 33 centimeters from the floor of the container and surrounded by other luggage. The suitcase was likely not x-rayed in London as bags from other large international airports such as Frankfurt are assumed safe and are fast-tracked through the connecting baggage system. The plane involved in Flight 103 itself, as previously discussed, was one of the first 747s ever built. Pan Am originally christened this plane as Clipper Morning Light, but this was later changed to Clipper Made of the Seas. Clipper refers to the origins of Pan Am, where the airline flew large seaplanes named Clippers in the 1930s. Just after 6 p.m. on December 21st, 1988, the plane pushes back from the gate and is airborne just before 7.30, heading to New York. That night, the plane was routed north towards Scotland. This was in order for the crew to get the best North Atlantic tracking across the ocean. High winds of the Atlantic often mean that routes across to and from the states often change day to day. Typically, the wind blows from west to east across the North Atlantic, meaning most times pilots have to fight a headwind the whole way along. To help mitigate this problem, meteorological observations at Shanwick Oceanic Control publish the best routes between Europe and North America, and airlines and crew plan accordingly. On this evening, on the 21st of December, the crew of Pan Am 103 leave London following a standard instrument departure which takes them directly over the town of Daventry, before heading further north over the Pole Hill VOR heading towards Scotland. The captain on tonight's flight is James Bruce McQuarrie, who is 55. He has accumulated over 11,000 flight hours, and tonight is his last flight before Christmas. At 2 minutes to 7 p.m., flight 103 was handed off from Scottish Centre to Shamwick Oceanic, where they established two-way communications, and at 2 minutes past 7, Shamwick transmits his clearance for flight 103 to turn out over the Atlantic. 
However, the message was not returned. And a few seconds later, the air traffic controller's monitor, which displays radar coverage of this area, feeds back five distinct radar echoes where the plane was. The cockpit voice recorder on board Flight 103 revealed the sound of a very loud explosion just before going dead. The bomb inside AVE-4041 exploded just after 7pm, puncturing a hole about half a meter wide in the fuselage. For reference as to where the bomb exploded, it was just below the P in Panam on the left side of the fuselage. When a bomb explodes on a plane, the aim of the bomber is not to necessarily ignite the fuel tanks, but to rather weaken the structural integrity of the plane so that it disintegrates. Such was the case when a bomb was detonated on board an Air India plane off the coast of Ireland a few years prior. In that incident, the plane's wreckage laid at the bottom of the ocean. However, in the case of Flight 103, wreckage was strewn over a very large area of Scotland and Northern England in two distinct fields of debris. The massive difference in air pressure between the aircraft's interior and exterior helped to tear the plane apart now that a weakness had been exposed. The nose section was separated from the rest of the plane, as the main bulk of the wreckage plummeted to the ground over Lockerbie. The cascade of wreckage and kerosene jet fuel rained upon the quiet village, demolishing several homes and killing 11 people on the ground. A British Airways pilot who was flying between London and Glasgow that night sent out a transmission to air traffic control that he could see fire on the ground in the county of Dumfries and Galloway. In total, 270 people were killed. What was the motive for the bombing, and how was Libya involved? In 2003, Libya admitted responsibility for the bombing and offered to pay nearly $3 billion to settle claims made by relatives. Libya says the motive was linked to a string of incidents between Libya and the US Navy in the 1980s. Alternative theories sprung up speculating an Iranian Ayatollah involvement in the attack stating that the bombing was in part revenge for the US shooting down an Iranian passenger plane earlier that same year. This incident will be subject to its own video in the future. Abdel Basset al-Magrahi was convicted as the sole perpetrator in the Lockerbie bombing in 2001. The description that Gauchi gave, 5 foot 10, dark skinned, Libyan accent, clean shaven and a muscular build, with the exception of the Libyan origin, this does not match the description of Magrahi. Experts on the case from Scotland and North America seem to agree that McGrahy did have some involvement with the bombing but wasn't working alone. Some say he was framed by the Libyan government, and again, some still believe that he was completely innocent. Whoever entered the store that day is believed to have been the bomber, but whether or not it was McGrahy is up for debate. However, I won't take this any further as I do not wish to step into that territory of conspiracy theories and hot take opinions. However, I would like to invite you to explore this on your own and arrive at your own conclusions. Thanks for making it to the end of the video, and an even bigger thank you for making it to the very end. If you have enjoyed this video, please do leave a rating and also subscribe for more content in the future. On the screen right now, you'll see two links to two other episodes I have on this channel. If you also feel like it as well, you can also come check out my personal channel as well. Bear in mind it is a lot different and a lot less formal. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. See you next time.